Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us uh, today for this webinar on Dairy Australia's new online dry cow consult tool. Uh, my name is Erica Oakes, and I'm the Program Development Manager in Animal Health and Fertility here at Dairy Australia, and I work on the Countdown Program with our Countdown Program leader, Mark Humphreys, who is also on the line. Um, before we get started, I'll just go through some housekeeping uh, on the webinar platform. So this webinar will be recorded and we will put it up on the Dairy Australia website for future reference and to pass on to other people. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, if you can type them into the box in the bottom left hand corner, when they come up, um, I'll, I'll read them out and Mark will answer them to the best of his ability. Um, so on that note, I'll pass over to Mark. Okay, thanks Erica. So what I'd like to cover today is, is firstly some background with dry cow management and why it remains such a critical control point in mastitis control. I also want to discuss how the change in bacteria that is causing much of our mastitis has changed over the years and the implications that that has on our dry cow management into the future. I'll then discuss um, why we've gone to the trouble of developing a dry cow management tool and then use an example with demonstrating how the tool works. So Cassandra, if I could just put up that first poll. Um, if you could just uh, get an idea of, of uh, who's, who's in the audience today, it's good to see a good number of people uh, online. A few field officers, quite a few vets, and some farmers. Okay, thanks, Cassandra. We'll stop the poll there. So, firstly, um, I'd just like to discuss, uh, put this in context, and, and discuss um, dry cow management. I've drawn up here the critical aspects of mastitis control with, with some attempt to at the relative importance of each of these areas. Now we could all argue about the relative size of the boxes and how they can contribute to mastitis control, but we'll also be aware that for individual farmers there may be one or more areas that need particular attention and improvement. But that said, through this diagram I'm trying to illustrate the importance of dry cow management and many of you know that if you if dry cow and calving management is not up to scratch, then there is not only lots of clinical mastitis at calving, but these cows often repeat and have high cell counts that lead, lead to a year of pain, as I describe it, before you get an opportunity to reset these cows again, if they last that long. Antibiotic dry cow therapy has been around since the 1950s and has been a successful cornerstone of mastitis control. When discussing the goals of the dry period, I've always found it helpful to reflect on the two aims of mastitis control in the dry period. That is to treat existing subclinical infections that have been acquired during the previous lactation or the, or the, the current lactation, and also to prevent new infections that can occur during the dry period. So the, the dry period is the best time to treat subclinical infections, and these should not as a guiding principle be treated during lactation due to the high cost and low success. This graph was originally produced in 1981, shows how the rate of new infection changes across the, dry, uh, across the, the cow's production cycle. This research has been supported over the years, most notably by Bradley and Green's work in 2000. And they showed that approximately 50% of clinical cases were involved from environmental pathogens um, occurring in the first 76 to 100 days of lactation were actually um, of dry period origin. So why are the dry cows at risk? Well, we stop removing milk and there's no flushing of bacteria twice a day. There's also um, the lactoferrin, uh, which inhibits bacterial growth by binding iron, becomes diluted in the early dry period. 
There's also a decreased leukocyte or white blood cell function during the early dry period. And we stopped using teat disinfection, so missed the opportunity to kill bacteria on the surface of the teats. And there's also anatomic changes where in the dry period where the teat canal actually gets shorter, so there's increased risk of bacteria getting in. And um, what's widely known these days is that there's often a delay in keratin plug formation, as we can see on the next slide. So various researchers have been able to demonstrate how there's great variation in the formation of the keratin plug over the dry period. And that keratin plug offers uh, increased resistance to bacteria. And so you can see from this table here, um, still after six weeks in the dry period, 20% of cows have not formed a keratin plug and therefore much greater risk to environmental mastitis. Um, this is a graph uh, that, uh, of Jacobs that we used at the geriatrics a, a couple of years ago or a few years ago. On clinical cases um, uh, of, of 10 farms uh, separated by the interval from calving. It shows when most of the cows are getting mastitis. Now this, this graph shows that the majority of the herds had 40 to 50 percent of the cases for the whole lactation happening in the first 30 days. I'm sure that if you were to collect the data from many of your, your suppliers or clients that it would look similar to this graph and demonstrates the need for good dry and calving management. So if we also look at what's causing mastitis, now again this is quite an old slide um, of, uh, from the McAllister district from Jacob. This is showing the change in pathogen profile of what's causing mastitis. And while this data is from our area in Gippsland um, in Victoria, it would reflect a general trend not only around Australia but around the world in the reduction in contagious pathogens and an increase in the environmental um, bacteria. So the reduction in contagious pathogens or cow associated pathogens reflects improved management through antibiotic dry cow therapy and the widespread adoption of post milking teat disinfection which reduces the spread of bacteria at milking time. The relative increase in proportions of environmental bacteria and specifically strep uberus reflects a concurrent intensification of how we manage dairy farms. So examples such as an increase in cows congregating in calving and feed pads, increased docking density, increased milk production at calving through improved feeding in the transition period, as well as, well as increased faecal shedding of environmental pathogens are some of the drivers of the, these changes. Mark, we've just had a question here from Elaine. Um, do we know where mycoplasma sits in that? Uh, incredibly low. Yep. yep. <clears throat> um, so this is a, another um, study which many of you will be familiar with um, from uh, the Zoeta study that was done a number of years ago showing uh, the very high incidence of strep uberus. Um, these were collected from 3,000 clinical cases across 65 farms in Victoria and Tasmania um, by Zoetis and their researchers a number of years ago. So in terms of resources supporting good dry cow management, up until now we've had the Tech Notes, which is actually Tech Note 14 right through to Tech Note 20, um, that also supports the farm guidelines of the same number. And we've had the Mastitis Focus Report. Um, more recently we've developed Shed Guide videos, which I'll show you uh, an excerpt from later, and also the Countdown app. The majority of controls of achieving a successful dry period can be summarised by the following sort of slide. So firstly, that you need to select the right cows for dry cow therapy and cull the wrong cows. Secondly, that good early pregnancy diagnosis and individual cow management are necessary to optimise milk production and increase the predictability of when a cow calves. Thirdly, that achieving the right production between 5 and 12 litres at dry off is important in minimising risk of mastitis in that subsequent lactation. 
and certainly being aware of the dangers that drying off with an antibiotic at very low production can create with residues. There has been more violations caused by this as the udder in its partly dried off or involuted state cannot adequately metabolise or use the antibiotic before calving again, even if they're outside the minimum withhold period for the product. But then it's a matter of choosing the right products and whether a cow needs an antibiotic or not, or an internal tink sealant or not. And achieving the right administration is perhaps where some of the biggest gains can be achieved on many farms, and we'll discuss later how this may be achieved. Lastly, it's a matter of being careful about the environment before and after dry off, and monitoring the cows in the dry period as well as measuring performance when they calve. So two of the main measures of success of the dry period are calving time mastitis, and whether there's been any clinical mastitis events in the dry period. So calving time mastitis is, is mastitis in the first 14 days after calving. And not only is it a measurement of the dry period, uh, the dry cow management, but it's also obviously a measurement of calving management. And without this statistic, you have no direction in your advice or improvements on your own farm. You are in a way rudderless and can't offer you know, your suppliers or, or clients any, any reason for change. And sometimes I think failing to measure performance after we put an intervention in place is one of the major barriers to more effective uptake of improvements and interventions. So without the measurement of calving time mastitis, we allow the opinion of whether an intervention has worked, um, up, it, it, it's essentially opinion. Um, and often that's not uh, actually correct. Um, Cassandra, if we just put up that other poll question, please. So what percentage of your clients or suppliers do you have detailed conversations about dry off management using countdown resources? If you could just reply to that poll on your computer, that'd be great. Okay, thanks very much for that. So, why a dry cow management tool? So experienced milk quality investigators and researchers and advisors believe that there is still great room for improvement in the dry period. Given current performance in terms of calving time mastitis in many herds, the bacteria that causes most of the dairy cattle mastitis and the timing of which they get mastitis, um, we certainly feel that there's there's room for great improvement. So one of the aims of the tool is to facilitate better conversations about dry cow management, which we hope will drive improvements in outcomes. Another reason, another major reason we have developed this resource is that hopefully we're in a stronger position to manage future changes to dry cow management, which I'll discuss shortly. And certainly in terms of better conversations, what we're really supporting is, is better prescribing of the products around dry off. So what are the improved outcomes that we're looking for? So we've already discussed two of these being clinical mastitis in the dry period and importantly at calving time uh, in, and in the first 14 days after calving. But also improved management leads to reduced individual cell counts and lowered bulk milk cell count. So as a milk quality advisor, I've always thought this is often the biggest impact you can have on a farm through improved dry cow and calving management. It's just uh, relatively, if you can get it right, it's, it makes a, a significant impact uh, for the farm. So another outcome that the whole industry needs is reduced antibiotic violations. Increased customer and consumer awareness and sensitivity towards antibiotic residues is, is backed by a rising prevalence of antibiotic resistance, and the associated global public health concern. We especially need vets to have a stronger voice with their clients' use of antibiotics as the world has changed significantly 
in the last couple of years with respect to antibiotic testing and tolerance. We need to support better practices such as developing batch lists for drying off and when the cow's milk is safe for consumption after calving. So this picture shows a, a cow with severe mastitis after drying off. Um, this is completely avoidable um, with hygienic administration and we've just got to do better. Similarly, we want to cut down the number of clinical cases at, at calving. The responsible use of antibiotics and concerns around antimicrobial resistance are really pervading all areas of both veterinary and human medicine. It is really the prescribing clinician's responsibility to ensure that the use of antibiotics is justified in all situations. Increasingly, the assurances uh, justifying the prescription and the use of antibiotics are under scrutiny and may be subject to challenge and change in the future. And the use of antibiotics at dry off is one such area of possible challenge. Dry cow antibiotics were introduced in the 1950s as part of a, a structured five point mastitis plan and was really quite successful in improving the chance of eliminating existing infections and affording some protection from new intramammary infections during the dry period. The prevalence of persistent contagious pathogens has declined as we've already discussed and similarly the need for blanket dry cow therapy in every cow has also diminished. We look at global trends in dry cow management. When the Dutch legislation uh, came, came through effectively banning blanket antibiotic dry cow therapy, I was initially affronted that someone or some group thought that they could just take away one of the cornerstones of mastitis control. But when you take a step back and look at what we are doing plus what we can achieve without it, we have to consider it in a different light. So now the UK and other European countries are following Holland's lead with incentivising selective dry cow therapy. So that means only using um, antibiotics where a cow needs it. Or um, alternatively penalising the producer if, it, if they don't use selective dry cow therapy. Antimicrobial resistance is very real and quite rightly has climbed the political agenda. Changes to how we drive cows in the future will be one small part of our responsibility towards preserving um, antibiotics, the function and efficacy of, of antibiotics. So I think this is a, yet another real example um, how our dairy business operates within a much bigger supply chain where we actually need to understand and work together to achieve success. So what what needs to be stated here also is that Australia and in particular the Australian dairy industry currently has very low usage of antibiotics when compared with other countries. So um, on a recent study only Iceland, Finland, New Zealand and Sweden use less than Australia. The stricter regulatory environment has also meant that some antibiotics of critical importance have never been allowed to be used uh, in cattle, never been registered. Also very important to, to add into this conversation that there is no evidence to suggest that blanket antibiotic dry cow therapy leads to antimicrobial resistance and also that no, there's no evidence to suggest that selective antibiotic therapy will produce, that will reduce the development of antimicrobial resistance. In my opinion it's not a question of whether we will need to move away from blanket antibiotic therapy, it's just a question of when. So moving on to how the tool works, um, it's uh, online at um, drycowconsult.com.au. It's designed to guide discussion on improvements in management of the dry period. So with developing this tool, which we've had lots of support um, from uh, professionals from the vet industry and uh, milk companies and our countdown team, we were certainly conscious that for some farmers it would be need, it'd need to be about a five minute conversation and that's okay but for, for other farmers the discussion stimulated by the tool could last an hour and a half. Ideally this is something that should be done annually as part of a review of performance and we acknowledge that 
that many farmers will not have uh, knowledge or will not have accurate records for you to calculate um, the calving time mastitis. But hopefully through this process, we, we hope that through talking with veterinarians and other countdown advisors that over time more data can be used to make better decisions. We see it being used by veterinarians and field officers and quality managers who have been trained um, in the advisor short course. Ultimately though, a veterinarian will be responsible for the prescribing of the product. But there will be many trained countdown advisors that will be able to assist farmers through this consultation. So through the submitted answers, uh, the tool establishes a measure of mastitis risk at trial and creates a simple report of risks and actions. But like any consultation, I think we need to be conscious that we need to acknowledge and respect uh, past practice. Um, and this next diagram, I think, like many of us, farmers are cyclic learners, so they establish uh, what, what works and, uh, and what doesn't through doing it many times. Um, so I think being able to understand and respect what farmers have done in the past is critical as it needs to be acknowledged that through their measures it has brought results. This is a critical step before discussing new options for management or products. So I asked my brother if he'd mind using his farm in stepping through the dry cow consult term, uh, tool. Uh, Tim milks 350 cows up in Tongala and uh, in a, uh, currently a seasonal calving herd. Um, last year he actually made some more significant changes to the way in which he dries off but also the products used. And I'll, I'll use his information as we step through the tool. So what I've done here is to actually just take um, screenshots of the website uh, so it's easier to, for you to see this afternoon. So the tool steps through the critical control points um, as I discussed previously. So firstly, um, it's the, basically it's one page of, of data entry and then, that, that then you, you move to a report. So just putting in the name and the emails that you want to send the report to, number of cows to dry off, um, and then asking some questions um, about bulk milk cell count whether um, you have the farm that you're dealing with has a calving time mastitis greater than 5% in cows or in heifers. And as I said before, it's uh, where some, some farms will, will not know this, but it's a conversation that is, is pivotal um, to actually reflect appropriately and, and review previous performance to see what can be done in the future. And the first question is on, on the cows. So looking at what, what cows you cull and how we've set it up, um, you, with this question you actually respond by actually saying currently doing this and plan to continue or it's something new so you're planning to do this or alternatively you're not interested in, in doing this in your farm. So looking at um, culling cows, looking at um, repeat cases or um, your management with three titters, um, and also uh, how you use uh, herd test data as well. So as Tim does do herd testing and enters his clinical mastitis in, in his herd management software, we're able to produce a mastitis focus report, not through this website, through the mastitis focus website, but this, is, this informs the discussions around the dry cow um, consultation. On the mastitis focus report you can easily see the clinical mastitis rate at calving. So in Tim's third it's four um, and that's the, co the combination of um, cows and heifers. Uh, heifers is actually uh, three percent. Um, other things that you can see um, in the mastitis focus report are looking at uh, failure to cure over the dry period, um, infections over the dry period and dry period clinical case rate as well as um, in the bottom right hand corner of the uh, mastitis focus report looking at the next drying off. So I think um, it says no next to you have four or more cell counts for each cow because I think this was generated just a short while ago in terms of um, 
a lot of cows haven't had four counts in this in this lactation. So where people do have um, her test figures and clinical case information, it makes it a lot easier to actually do that first question. So moving on to the second question, um, we look at the right timing. So looking at pregnancy diagnosis and mating records um, and then a, a question, I suppose, to get the conversation started, how often do cows carve to their expected calving date? So whether it's often, mostly or rarely and that can certainly stimulate discussion around risk uh, of antibiotic residues and things like that and, and also um, live production as we talked about. And question four goes into the products to be used, um, not specifics, but uh, either antibiotics or internal teeth sealants. The good data from herd testing really underpins the good decision making about dry off products. So asking about this and other record keeping is important in, in formulating the plan. So under antibiotics, um, it can be um, no antibiotics, selective or blanket, and similarly, um, these are the headings under internal teeth sealants. So in Tim's herd, um, he doesn't have uh, culture results that prove that he doesn't have uh, strep agalactia. Um, and he has elected to use antibiotic in cows with any test over 150,000 cells per mil um, or cows that have had a clinical case during the current lactation. And all other cows um, have internal teeth sealants only. And he doesn't use any internal teeth sealants in heifers. Um, he's able to maintain a very low calving time mastitis in heifers, so there's no, no benefit there. And then um, we look at, ask questions around application. So um, it can be a big discussion, and for quite a few farms, um, it would probably be even much better to actually dry some cows off with them. So this hopefully might stimulate uh, a discussion about uh, staff training um, uh, that might be able to be done. And down the bottom there, um, I've got a question on a dry off batch list with cow ID, dry off date, etc., able to be generated. That's really a, a measure of risk. And if we look at just um, a, an example here of, um, of, a, of a batch list for drying off, looking at the, the ID, the different dry-off dates, what product they're going to get, um, and the withhold period for milk and the withhold period for the calf. Um, very clear when you go to, to drying off, uh, to dry off a cow to actually then select um, or, or, or tick those cows that have actually been dried off. Um, and then further, um, to uh, to establish a cow ID, a list in cow ID order. Really important for dairy staff to, to quickly work out when a cow calves, whether they're safe for the vat after their first eight milkings, um, after their first eight milkings or after four days after calving. The sort of examples of, of batch lists that, um, that I'm referring to there. Mark, we've just had a question from Ron. Are there figures for improved mastitis control using teat sealants and antibiotic dry cow treatment together? Uh, yes, there's certainly um, a lot of studies um, there, Ron. So I can, um, if you want, I can collect a few of those studies and, and email them to you. Great. And just another question quickly. Um, Bruce is asking, um, what do you consider the maximum target cases as mastitis in heifers? Mm, maximum, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, well, maximum target, really, um, it, it's, the, it's the same as, as cows. So 5% of uh, clinical mastitis in the first 14 days after calving. So um, certainly very achievable um, through, in some situations, through man management um, and also achievable through, if required, using internal teeth sealant in heifers prior to calving. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, just moving on to the last question, question six, it really leads the conversation about aftercare and monitoring. So you can see that it's very, it's quite, uh, it's quite simple, quite straightforward, but it can, um, with the right kind of demand from from the farmer, be quite a big conversation. So then you press the the uh, the next um, next screen and develops a report that's um, uh, with risks, actions, and the dry cow plan. So this can then be emailed as a PDF to anyone or printed directly for the for the farm manager. So this PDF can be attached to to other client veterinary software as evidence and a, and a record of the discussion uh, for the prescription, or if field officers are doing it, attached to the milk company customer relation management software um, as a good record of, of the discussion. So this is sort of what we're aiming for, something fairly brief in, in highlighting those risks that have, that have popped out of, um, out of the consultation, looking at the opportunities and, and also um, looking at the, the, the product plan, which will obviously um, have further, more detail um, that a vet, veterinarian can add um, as they prescribe those products. Um, you'll notice that um, the countdown videos are, are certainly featured um, in the report. And um, I've just actually got a, a sort of an abridged version of the countdown video, um, and hopefully many of you have, have used and, and uh, seen that. Um, but if we could just put that video up. Actually, Mark, just before we put on, go on to the video, we just had a question from Donna. Um, if the farmer doesn't have herd test data, how extensive will the report be? Okay, um, thanks for the question, Donna. Um, certainly. Um, it's probably going to be easier for you to see once you pull up the dry cow consult uh, yourself. It's really um, probably more, um, it's more of a, a subjective assessment and a, and a discussion starter. Um, and if there is, if people do not herd test, well then um, you still may have the ability to actually determine calving time mastitis, which will direct, you know, how much um, extra you can do to achieve the the targets of, of less than five percent calving time mastitis. So um, it's certainly more limited as to what you can do in terms of selective dry cow therapy if you don't do herd testing. Um, but uh, it's still um, a, a great tool for for you know discussing the the critical elements of of improvement. Okay, so we're right to go forward to the video, Erica? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so if you haven't seen it, um, I think Cassandra is just going to play um, this short video. I've deliberately turned the sound down because it's one thing you can't handle is hearing your own voice. Um, but um, so you can use this. Uh, stopped. Um, you can use this video <coughs> with your. By, for yourselves or with your clients and suppliers, um, just going through the administration and the critical elements of getting it right in terms of using an antibiotic and <clears throat> massaging that into the udder. And also um, talking about best practice in terms of administering an internal teat sealant, including the top of the teat. Um, before uh, teat spraying. So hopefully, um, hopefully you can use those videos um, as well. Thanks, Cassandra. I've just put a link uh, in the comments box there to where you can find the videos on the Dairy Australia website as well. Thanks very much, Erica. So um, other activities that um, Countdown's got planned, um, there's a discussion group module that's being developed for launching in February, March. Um, so we're really wanting uh, Countdown advisors that want to showcase their advisory and facilitation skills to use the resources that we're developing and jumping into their local discussion groups. So 
um, get in touch with us if you want uh, to be part of that. Um, it's certainly been designed, it, it, it's really about um, developing a, a dry cow plan for the host farm. It's not uh, a seminar in a shed, it's really working with the farmer and um, I suppose understanding their, well, um, working with the farmer to develop their plan um, and really to, to show what can be done through the, through the consultation um, and planning with dry cow management. And there's also uh, University of Melbourne master's uh, student that's, that's uh, starting some research, well, started the, the paperwork, but starting um, with a, a research trial on some dry cows next month um, that will continue throughout next year. So there will be more information um, with regard to uh, the dry cow management um, over, over the next uh, year or two, combined with um, some really uh, significant trials that are being done currently in New Zealand. So um, we're, we're heading to our list of uh, resources. We've got, uh, as I said before, we've got the tech notes, farm um, guidelines, Mastitis focus report if you are herd testing. Um, we've got the videos, the app, and now a online dry cow consult that um, we encourage you to use with your clients and suppliers. Um, I think advocacy works really well when a group other than your own promotes your work. So in this instance that we're talking about, we know we have the milk company support for improved conversations at dry off. We know that by having improved conversations, um, there'll be less antibiotic residues and more care um, around calving time or cows that re-enter the herd. So field staff will be promoting the dry cow consultations, which will predominantly um, be carried out by veterinarians. But equally, the milk companies need veterinarians to have a stronger voice with how these antibiotics, and specifically dry cow antibiotics, are used and the withholds around calving time. So it's really, I suppose, uh, the, those two groups supporting each other in, in um, achieving, achieving success. So um, we can build the resources, but we need you to, uh, to utilise them. Um, so we would encourage uh, you to use it with your suppliers and clients um, and provide feedback to Erica or myself. So there's the web address. Um, and if there's any questions, I will answer them if I can. So if you've got any questions uh, that you'd like to ask us, just write them in the bottom left hand corner now. That would be good. Um, or if you don't have questions for now, Mark and I are also happy to take them offline. I'll just go back to take them offline. I'll just go back to, to put the um, uh, email addresses there. Okay, cool. We've had a question here from Christopher. Uh, what about sheds where they measure milk conductivity instead of somatic cell count? Good question, Chris. Um, I think that um, that's where the skill of uh, the countdown, the local countdown advisor comes in to uh, try and establish um, some measure of, of infected or not and, and where that, um, that confidence is. Um, Chris, I know that um, Alison Gunn and there's probably many others, but Alison's certainly done uh, a reasonable amount of work with uh, trying to decipher and interpret um, well, um, oh, I've just reread your question. Uh, sorry, I was actually saying Alison's done a fair bit with interpreting cell sense um, uh, data. In terms of conductivity, um, I have a very low opinion of the correlation of, of conductivity with somatic cell count and um, so I certainly wouldn't be using conductivity. I think that um, the cell sense automated technology is something that can, um, with some effort, be relied upon. But I would certainly not be using uh, conductivity. 
um, yeah, hopefully it should be uh, able to be pulled up there, Tash, at um, yeah, drycowconsult.com.au. All right, well, if we have no, many, no more questions, I think we might wrap it up there. So thanks, everyone, for joining us, and thanks, Mark, for presenting. And um, as I said, this is being recorded, and we'll put it up on the Dairy Australia website, and once it's available, We'll send out an email to everyone that registered. And if you do have any feedback, um, please do let Mark and myself know. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Erica.